Before the 1950s, car manufacturers had a problem. Safety. Sharp flanges, metal that didn't crumple, untempered glass. And you can forget about seatbelts and airbags. Cars were dangerous. The problem was that the study of crashes was the study of the aftermath. Trying to piece together what went wrong from a few vague clues. That's a pretty tough environment to learn from. If the auto industry wanted to get safer, they needed a hero. Someone that would allow them to study crashes from the inside. They needed Sierra Sam, the world's first crash test dummy. Over the course of Sam's life, Sam endured all manner of, uh, testing. But these weren't random incidents. Each one was carefully planned and dissected. For the first time, Sam allowed experts to study what happens in a car crash as it happened, and then make adjustments to the cars accordingly, without the need for anyone to get hurt. So you can thank Sam for airbags, seatbelts, and all the things we take for granted. The safety features that were only made possible by studying crashes in real time. Today, car companies rely on dummies like Sam to create cars safe enough for us to drive every day. But what about the technology we use every day? How do we ensure it's secure, shored up, and has safety features built in to protect the people who use it? The same way the auto industry did all those years ago, by breaking things over and over, and then studying exactly what failed from the inside. When it's your job to keep billions of people safe online, you have to live and breathe and see the internet just like the attackers do. Because the only way to stop a hacker is to think like one. This is Daniel Fabian. Hey. Despite his disarming presence, he carries one of the most diabolical titles in all of Google. The job title I chose for myself is Steph Digital Arsonist. Yeah, uh, I run the offensive security team. So setting things on fire in this context mostly means to run uh, what we call red team exercises, where we basically take the role of an attacker and try to hack into Google. You heard that correctly. Google's red team is a group of security employees who spend their days just trying to break Google's security. I think it's totally fine to just say we're hackers. I was always kind of interested in like the mechanics behind things. I remember my mom got super upset because I disassembled one of her watches. No particular reason outside of curiosity how it works. Tiny gear wheels and they all click together. It just fascinated me. Uh, I wasn't able to put it to, back together to, just to get ahead of that question. Um, but I, I think a hacker is someone who tries to break things in order to understand them. It may sound unsurprising, but this hacker mentality is shared by many of Daniel's colleagues. I mean, since I like taking things apart and finding issues, uh, the best place to do it is in the red team. <laughs> this is Neeru Raghupathy, a security engineer on the red team. But in some circles, she's known by a different name. My handle is Corgi. <laughs> Beyond screen names and avatars, she's even got the hardware to prove it. I should have never told the Corgi story. <laughs> it's supposed to be an Easter egg. <laughs> yes. I would say I'm a hacker. I might qualify it by saying I'm an ethical hacker, where you're not hacking to steal things, you're hacking to help fix things. What's your relationship like with the red team? The red team are my favorite enemies. They bring a completely new way of looking at the system because they're not burdened every day with having to maintain it, with having to deal with the reliability issues and functionality issues. And that's so valuable for us understanding that we didn't actually build it always the way we thought we did. 
how does it hold up against actual hackers? That's kind of our job as a red team to come give that answer. So they're kind of like our agents of testing, if you will. Just as car companies have different models and components to test, Google has different products and infrastructure, each with unique features and security controls. And it's the red team's job to put all of them through their paces. We'll let Daniel and Nero give you some hits. Yeah, sounds good. We have targeted ads, we've targeted search, we've targeted Gmail, Google Cloud, Chrome, YouTube, Maps. What else did we target? Um, you get it. Yeah, whatever. Every single Google product, each with its own security team dedicated to keeping it safe. And the red team, they've targeted them all. In fact, the mere mention of one red team exploit is enough to put security engineers in cold sweats. Ooh, yes. I have heard of the infamous Plasma Globe. One of the uh, most creative exercises. Most memorable exercise. Anyone would fall for it. <laughs> I heard about it, but I, it might have been before I joined Google. All right, so it's not the newest exercise, which is probably most apparent when discussing the target. Back when we ran the exercise, like the latest, newest, bestest Google product were Google Class. <laughs> This can go wrong in about 500 different ways. So tell me now, who wants to see a demo of Glass? That's right, Google Glass. A phone for your face. It's part of my life, I'm never gonna take it off. Google's first venture into wearable technology. We wanted to target people who work on Google Glass so we could get access to design documents, blueprints, the electronics behind it, everything that a real adversary would be very interested in. Some of red teaming is to actually understand how people in the real world are causing harm and actually emulate their behaviors. That doesn't mean that we will do everything an adversary does, right? Right. The red team has something that most attackers don't. Rules. Yeah. We have a set of rules that we call rules of engagement. First of all, don't break anything. Another obvious one is we can never ever access real customer data. The rules are also there to make sure no one actually gets hurt. Yes. <laughs> no bribing, no coercion. They literally say it's not okay to chloroform security guards. Yes, obviously we don't do that as well. So in our exercise, we kept thinking, okay, what could we do to get Googlers to actually give us access to their computers? And one idea that we had is we could send them a small gimmick under some pretense, like congratulations on your anniversary for working at Google. Here is a small gift. So what was this devious doomsday device that the team gifted to unsuspecting Googlers? Yeah, I, I have it here, actually. I searched my attic and I found it. It looks just like a very, very regular USB plasma globe. There is a thing as a regular USB plasma globe. Yes, a USB powered version of the science gift shop favorite, adorned with a Google decal and loaded with malicious software. Now remember, this was 2012, a time when USB was perhaps the most ubiquitous interface on the market. Beyond thumb drives or webcams, people were plugging in fans, lights, fans with lights, charging devices you use every day, and pointless things you only use once. But once is all it takes. No matter how the ports were used, plugging in a USB could exploit a soft spot on a computer, allowing an attacker to easily get inside. When you plugged in the plasma globe, if you were super careful, you would see for like about a tenth of a second or so, a black window flash up on the screen. And that's when the plasma globe would send a series of keystrokes to the computer that would download our backdoor and install it on the computer. And that is that. To be fair, not everyone plugged it in, so there were definitely some people who were careful. Uh, however, we did get two or three people who plugged it in and who, who got infected. You might imagine successfully compromising these computers would mean the end of this story, but... Okay, I, I should take a step back. 
the people that we compromised using the USB Plasma Globe were actually completely unrelated to Google Glass. Oftentimes, when you first get your foot in through the door, you might not be near what you're trying to get to. So think of it like playing a video game. You're in this level, you cleared the first area, and now you're in a new area, and the map is just black, right? So usually, in order to get to the target, it is multiple different security exploits that we call a kill chain. Yep, a kill chain. A string of different attacks that bring hackers progressively closer to their goal. Despite the Plasma Globe's cunning success, it was only the first link in the kill chain used to steal the plans for Google Glass. After we used the Plasma Globe, we were able to assume the identity of the person we had compromised. And then we could use the privileges to access anything that that user has access to. Including their corporate email. The red team drafted fake emails using the stolen identities of the compromised employees and sent them to the real targets, who were busy working on Google Glass. At the very bottom of the email, there was a tiny image. And that image was loaded from our website that we built. That website would lift the target's digital fingerprints without them knowing. But for it to work, the target would first have to open the email. We were thinking, OK, what kind of email is interesting enough that people would actually open it? but on the other hand, not so interesting that they would discuss it with other people. And the, the topic that we settled on eventually was workplace ergonomics. Even small movements can add up to big damage when they are done repetitively. So like, how do you sit in a healthy way and make sure that you have the right posture, and that your desk is the right height, and that you like don't get back problems, that sort of thing. When force is applied, the damage is multiplied. Long story short is the email worked well. Emails were open, targets were compromised, digital fingerprints were captured. It was time for the red team to get what they came for. So we presented those identifiers that we stole back to Google. And Google Drive thought, hey, that's the user that works in Google Class and who has access to all the design documents and blueprints and everything related to Google Class and uh, allowed us to download them. By any measure, this marked the successful completion of the exercise. But then... But then we get really bold. Yes, we decided, OK, now we get all the blueprints. But it would be really cool if we got a physical pair of Google Glass glasses. The team pressed their luck and wrote a new email directly to one of the Google Glass team members. OK, we need to pick up a Google Glass for like some VIP at Google. So we're going to come to the office and, and pick it up. I hate lying to people, and I always get super nervous and anxious when, when I have to do that. So it turns out that we actually had like one or two grammar mistakes in there. <laughs> the mistakes were enough that when they arrived at the office, there was no pair of Google Glass waiting for them. And they were instead met by Google's head of physical security. Come control. So yes, we did eventually get detected. That was kind of like the backflip where we then fell on our noses. Even when the red team completes an exercise, the job is only half done. The other half, patching the holes the red team utilized to make their way onto Google systems, so no real attacker can use them in the future. In the case of the Plasma Globe exercise, the hole was quite literally that, a USB porthole in a computer found on nearly every one of the hundreds of thousands of Google corporate machines each one of them a potential point of entry for an attacker. Maybe a real attacker might not do the plasma globe thing, but they have a lot of opportunities, whether that's, you know, USB keys kind of dropped in the car park, you know, modifying, you know, the mice that people plug into their devices, other things. And so understanding that that, that is an attack, how do we ensure that this class of issue that we're dealing with, how do we make that go away so that, you know, any USB device that, that you plug in isn't just open for an attacker to break in? So we had to figure out how we got to protect against this type of attack. And what we did was we developed a software that would defend USB ports against suspicious activity. Through USB, 
the plasma globe infected the machine by delivering hundreds of keystrokes of commands in a fraction of a second. Remember this? Yeah, that fast. Much faster than any human being could realistically type. This software listens for keystrokes. If the keystrokes come in too fast, then it blocks them. And just like that, USB ports across Google got a little bit safer. But what about the hundreds of millions of other USB ports and computers all around the world? Well, the nice thing about this fix is that we actually open sourced it as well. So anyone can install it on their machines and make sure that they are protected against this type of attack. Of course, this is just one of the countless patches Red Team exercises have created. They've helped make the internet safer for everyone. With that level of success, you'd think their work would make headlines and news stories. But the truth is, it doesn't, and probably never will. Red Team exercises are disappearing acts. Thousands of vulnerabilities brought to light and fixed in silence. The only real mementos are stronger, safer products for the billions of people that rely on them. If we are able to make changes that make the next exercise much more difficult, I say we've done an amazing job and, and we've actually achieved what we came here to achieve. And we do really see that because probably 90% of the stuff that we do just doesn't work. You try it, and if it fails, it's OK. You try again. Does that failure ever frustrate you? <laughs> it's a good thing that a team fails. That means that things are working well. We ask people in the world to tell us about security issues. Nice catch. Nice catch. Nice cut. That's why it's called bug hunting. It's like hunting <laughs> for bugs. These days you could sell that vulnerability on the gray market, almost certainly to exploit users. We will keep paying you if you keep reporting bugs. They were going to pay $10,000. Whoa, very nice catch. Oh my god. The best hackers in the world are securing the internet and everything that runs on it.